Hey, Chuck. <laughs> I wish over the years I would have had the opportunity to get to know you. Although I look forward to, you know, meeting you in heaven. But really, I don't think that we're going to run into each other except in the millennium. We'll be too busy checking out other things. But in the millennium, you know, I, I might trip over to Hawaii and see if you're there. You know, or maybe, you know, you could teach me how to surf. Yeah, I'm a Southern California son, but I don't know how to surf. My, my favorite story about Chuck, really, um, or I should say my, my first encounter with Chuck was, uh, my only encounter with Chuck, come to think of it, I used to sit way up front on Sunday nights, you know, and down at the bottom of his feet, so to speak, in front of the podium, because there was space there, you know, and I used to like laying out, you know, and laying down, you know, instead of sitting in pews, you know, as that Sunday nights were like, Chuck used to say it this way. Sunday mornings were for the sinners, but Sunday night were for the saints. It was like Sunday night was his time. And I remember there were times because I was recording the cassettes at the time, you know, and making duplicate copies for the tape lending library that Chuck would run over. You know, I mean, he would just go for it. And it would be like he'd be talking about maybe Revelation or the soon return of Jesus or the parable of ten virgins. And... I'll tell you, there's one tape that if I ever find it again, you know, that the original one, that, uh, man, he told a story about the parable of ten virgins, and it scared the willies out of everybody. I mean, we all felt like, whoa, I mean, don't get me wrong, it was still grace, but it was like, hey, you know, let the scripture, Chuck had a way of saying it this way, when you got to a place where it was going to be like cut and dry, close to hellfire and brimstone, he says, let the scriptures speak for themselves. And he would just kind of leave it at that. And he went, whoa. And it's almost as though he went, whoa, what happened to like, you know, all sugar and candy and everything nice, you know? And it was like, wow, blunt. And it was really good. And I remember those Sunday nights, you know, laying there, you know, and I'd be, you know, like with my Bible and stuff, you know, and, and um, he'd be teaching, you know, and, you know, he just taught in his own style, you know, he was paused. There was articulation with which you're able to think through the sentence structure. And, and there's a way of doing that, that I've met people like that who do that a lot. Their mindset and their mental alacrity recalls their capability to bring out the articulate factor of the way we phrase our conversation using the abilities of our mouth and our tongue to communicate ideas through the language that we have, which is English, in a proper manner that used to be done in olden days, like we would say King James days, or you know, like in the, the well-educated courtrooms or classrooms, you know, and I, I always often wondered if Chuck had been taught that because of that, or if it was just the way he did it. I, you know, I'm really not sure. I don't have any idea. You know, it just seemed to me that I've met a lot of people like that, especially in Jewish culture. But my favorite story about Chuck was, uh, I, I didn't know Chuck from Adam. You know? I mean, I, I went to Chuck, you know, I mean, I, I heard him on the radio, you know, and I was out in uh, Riverside, Norco area, and uh, I was living in my car. You know, I didn't have any money. I was disabled. You know, I was living off of Social Security. I was barely alive, you know, and and uh, I heard Chuck on the radio, and God said, go. You know, and the, the interesting thing was that when I got saved, the, let me tell a backstory a little bit about it. When I got saved, weird things happened to me. <laughs> things that I, I really didn't know what, what it was, you know, except for it was common to Jesus people at the time. That's what made them kind of freakish, you know, was that the Jesus people that I was around at first was out in Calvary Riverside. And it was called Calvary Riverside. You know, and Greg had the little church, you know, and he had chairs outside, you know, and we kind of... Sat, some people sat outside, so they got there early for the concerts, you know, and Sweet Comfort Band was playing, you know, and it was really unique. I mean, it was kind of neat, you know, was that I, I went to a concert, and Buddy brought me in a bug, you know, Super Beetle, you know, well, it's just regular bug, I think. And, you know, he kept going, and he kept telling me all these words, you know, he said he wanted to speak in tongues, and he wanted to get the gifts of the Spirit, and he wanted this and wanted that, and he kept saying all these weird words, you know, and I didn't know what he was talking about. So he took me and a buddy of mine, you know, to the concert, and my buddy was, you know, blonde haired, blue eyed, you know, carnal person that he was. You know, he always saw these women at Calvary Riverside that were gorgeous, you know. He was scouting them out. For me, I was shocked because when I looked at everyone, I just saw this glow. I saw this unbelievable 
joy, first of all, that I'd never seen on anybody's face before, this relaxed face, you know, structure that was just like young, and it was amazing. I mean, I just, I couldn't believe it. And then they would stand up, sit down, they would shake a hand next to you, they would laugh, they would sing, they would dance. It was just crazy. It was fun. As a matter of fact, that was probably the biggest thing that I remember about church and why I hate most Calvaries nowadays is because back then it was fun. Nowadays, most Calvaries that I have been a part of or gone to forgot how to be fun. You know, they get formal, they get structured, they get, you know, denominational. Matter of fact, most Calvaries that I've seen, you know, on Sunday morning, you know, it's like, or Sunday night, you know, whatever maybe. Man, you know, I mean, sure, they can put on a good performance when it comes to the worship service, but when the fun comes, it just isn't the fun that it used to be, man. You know, I mean, I, I understand that we're singing different songs, you know, it's like, okay, fine, they do it in Sunday school. That's probably where I should be, because I'm so old, you know, we should have the geezers, you know, praise band, you know. All those geezers get together and sing, you know. Sing, uh, I got this joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? You know, and, you know, go for it. You know, have fun. But anyways, that's what I saw. So that's what I remember. So I got saved there you know, at the concert, you know, and um, Sweet Comfort Band, you know, one of the guys grabbed me and they took me in the back. Me, you know. But the moment I got saved, it was miraculous. I mean, it was one of those, like you would say, Pentecostal type, slain in the spirit kind of thing almost, because I almost fell, but... They were holding on to me, and they were praying, you know, and I, from the top of my head down to my toes and up to my nose and right back out, and all it goes, you know, was everything that happened to me was, like, phenomenal. It was over the top, way beyond what most people would have experienced in those days, and I thought everyone experienced the same thing that I did. But anyways, the sensation of what people experience when you're dying is that in their um, mental processes usually come into acute focus. It's the same thing that happens for a heroin addict when they take heroin, they become, at least I'm told, I have never done Harold, um, that they can see things, they can see details, everything becomes sharp, their smell, sense of smell is heightened, there's a heightened awareness, there's this uh, mentation that is like firing off on all cylinders, so to speak, you know, in your brain cells. So anyways, the point being is this, I am more than that. <laughs> I've always laughed all my life, but I had joy, unbelievable. I had this love that was like, wow, I was like, ah, I was hugging people, you know, and man, I'd have slobbered on them if I could have got away with it, I don't know if I did or not, but my point is, from the moment that I asked Jesus into my life, instantly there was that emotional reaction, that emotional salvation, that knowledge and things started happening in my brain that, you know, didn't happen in other people. I thought it did, you know, I mean, I, it took me about five years to figure out that people didn't have the same experience I did. But I started knowing some scriptures without ever having read the Bible. You see, I didn't, I wasn't raised in any religion. I didn't grow up Jewish. I didn't grow up Catholic. I didn't grow up Protestant. I didn't grow up anything. You know, like sci-fi, you know, I mean, I read every sci-fi book there was, you know, in the library. Um, so I had great science fiction mind, but I didn't have anything as far as the knowledge of God was concerned. Nothing. I mean, nothing. I mean, I'm jealous over some of the people that, you know, grew up in the church or grew up in Sunday school and stuff like that. But my point is this. I had all these emotions, all this sudden stuff happening, and I could tell, like, people would say things to me. I could tell if they were lying. I could tell if they were, like, something was going on with them. They, they looked different. I could see something unusual about them. I could sense or feel something that was wrong about them. It was a discernment of spirits, you know, but I didn't know what it was called at the time. And it was lots of things like that happening right off the bat, you know, and I went, wow, that's kind of interesting, you know, and I was like, and I didn't have a chance to analyze it because I was just so full of, like, happiness. So I just ran home and started witnessing to my mother, you know, I didn't know any scriptures, I just knew John 316. Not because anybody told me that one, I just somehow knew that one for some reason. So I shared with her John 3.16, I said, you can be born again Catholic, you can be born again Christ, you can be born again anything, you can be born again Methodist Jews, whatever, you know, but you got to be born again. For that which is born in flesh, flesh, that born in spirit, spirit, you must be born again. Today, if you hear his voice, hard not your heart, it says, well, but, you know. So I went on, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm babbling, she said, go to your room, totally in the morning. So I didn't really get any follow-up. I didn't get any Bible. I didn't get any discipleship from Calvary Riverside. But, you know, I got what God gave me at the time, which was, wow, sir, you know, and I had this little New Testament, so, you know, I kind of, 
it seems like they gave me maybe a little mailing thing, but I know that I, if I mailed it in, I never got anything back, so it never got followed up on. But then I remember somehow I got a New Testament, but I think I got that on the way out the door or something, I'll grab one or something. I might even have stole it for all I know. But anyways, the point being is this. There wasn't really anything organized going on at that time. So, you know, I never made it back to church because I didn't have a car. And I never made it back to Calvary Riverside. Um, I wound up going through some experiences. But before I did go through those experiences, 40 days, which was really weird because, you know, I didn't know it. But, you know, I was I was wandering around, you know, my mother's house, you know, because I was still 17, you know. And, and I was trying to witness to her and then I was witnessing to people around, you know, and stuff like that. And then a buddy of mine asked me if I wanted to go with him to a home Bible study. And I said, sure, because he said Bible, and I was like, all for it. And so we went to this home Bible study up in Corona, California, up in the hills of the Orange Groves, and there's this carved door with Jesus on it, and it was like really awesome. So I go into this home Bible study, you know, and it was like really neat people in there, you know, and they were all like blessed, and they all glowed, you know, and I thought, yeah, yeah, and I'm like, yeah, 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 you say that, and you're crazy, and we're sharing scriptures, you know, back and forth, you know. For God so loved the world, that he gave us all together. Who they're bringing, shut up, perish, whatever. And, you know, like back and forth. And it's like, it was really fun. I mean, I enjoyed it. So they got to studying the Bible. And they were talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they were talking about the Holy Spirit. And they said, you know, if you haven't received the Holy Spirit, you know, we want to pray for you now that you receive the Holy Spirit. I didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was. You know, I didn't ask for it. You know, I didn't want it. You know, I said, I got Jesus. What do I need the Holy Spirit for? You know, and by that time, there's probably somebody snickering in the group. But, you know, I didn't know that. It was just a little circle, you know, it was like maybe five or six people, you know, so. Anyways, you know, the Bible study was good. We were in Matthew or something like that. I can't remember, but, you know, what happened was that I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> to this day, I can't tell you exactly what happened, but when it comes to slain in the spirit, no, there's no such a thing as slain in the spirit. But are you overwhelmed by the spirit of God? I was. Hey, I can only tell you what I experienced. And I woke up sitting in a chair, not unlike this, but the one over here that uh, it was three hours later, and I was sitting there speaking in tongues, and it was coming flying out of my mouth, and I was saying things, and the weird thing is, I knew what I was saying. I mean, I, I had this, I had interpretation of tongues. I knew somewhat, some of the things that were going on were from the Holy Spirit, and I knew that it was the Spirit of God, but I thought of it differently, and I still to this day have a teaching on it that's kind of interesting about, about how the unity of the body, of uh, unity, the unity of the Godhead and how it can be used in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and how God is present in but it was long story. But my point is this. Speaking in tongues, suddenly I'm like twice as much emotional experience that I had before, only this was like really going weird. I mean, it wasn't like I drank the Kool-Aid, you know, and suddenly got, you know, stoned or something, because I don't know what stoned is, but no, I mean, it was like, you know, I mean, I was like, whoa, electrified, charged. I mean, I was like, it was awesome. I mean... And to this day, it's still awesome. I mean, you know, I can... <laughs> yeah, you know, it wouldn't be long before I could just say, okay, you know, I'm kind of like... It'd be interesting. <laughs> and we're not going to record that. <laughs> and we're not going to do that. You know, no, 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 no. That's like, you know, some of those guys on TV. But my point is this. Um, when I went to Calvary, I was shy. I was intimidated. I was terrified. I was scared of Chuck Smith. I was scared of all these things because I heard him on the radio and I, I knew God spoke to me or God impre impressed upon me to go there. So I went, you know, and I took a leap of faith because I had read my Bible and, you know, I had said Abraham, you know, believed and was counted for righteousness. So he left his family and I left my family you know, and got my car and drove to to uh, Costa Mesa, and then I went in the parking lot and had some miraculous experiences with angels. There was an angel there, and it was a long story, but he gave me some money, and I like, disappeared before our eyes, which was like, in that day, was, you know, there was, a, it was, there was somebody else there that was a genuine witness of it, and he was just as shocked as I was, and we were both like, you know, with our mouth hanging open. So, yeah, I've seen angels, you know. I've had angels do things with me, or to me, or for me, in different ways and capacities. But my point is this, and I got together, you know, I was, I was learning these things, I had all these things going on, didn't know what they were, didn't know how many, what the gifts were. Later on, Romaine told me that you could have all the gifts of the Spirit, and I found out that, yeah, you can, because quite frankly, I did, you know, so, yeah, you know, well, some people don't, some people do, who knows, God does as he chooses, but my point is this, Chuck used to give the studies, and so I used to be up front, you know, on Sunday nights, and Sunday night, he would 
go down the middle, you know, after we were singing, you know, Lord bless you, keep the, you know, then he'd come forward, and then he'd be up front, or he'd be in the back, but, you know, when you first enter, and people would line up, you know, and ask him questions, you know, they'd, you know, they'd have the Bible, or they'd come up to shake his hand, or whatever, you know, and Chuck would always do that, he was always there, you know, he was always there to answer questions, and it was always like, You'd see him, and I was like, I'd watch him, you know, and I'd just like, wow, that's cool. You know, I said, like, man. Because like, I never had a father, so, I, you know, I, I didn't have any father figures to look up to. I didn't know how to relate to men, really. I mean, men were kind of like, you know, I, really, I knew how to relate to women, but I didn't relate to men so well. You know, men were kind of, you know, I didn't get their, their shtick, you know. They always had these egos and attitudes and things I just didn't understand, you know. So being saved now, I was really messed up about all of this because it's kind of like, hmm, now, now what do I do? Because, you know, I could tick off people, but I wasn't really the manly man. You know? I mean, sure, I played tennis, I earned a letter, I did all those stupid things that men do, you know, boys do. You know, they, uh, but really, you know, didn't I didn't disconnect with, I didn't get my, my normal venue of opening up in some way, because I was such a shy wallflower type person, was not with men. You know, I was able to talk to women and communicate with them easily, but not with men. So, when Chuck, you know, I was looking and watching him, you know, finally one day I, I was... Um, I had gone to Bible study seven days a week, and I was volunteering at, oh, the college and career group. I helped set up chairs, the worship um, community. Well, not, it was the worship community at that time. It was the, um, the worship team practice or the worship team. Well, anyways, I'd go over and help worship set up, you know. Then I'd go over and help college and career set up, you know, in the fellowship hall. And I remember setting up chairs a lot. You know, I'd go around everywhere that I was, you know, setting up chairs. But most days, I worked over at the Tate Lending Library at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, with Maddie and Eileen, duplicating the tapes so that we could send out the message, because we mailed out tapes everywhere around the country, around the world. People would come in by the thousands, you know, to get tapes, and we'd hand them out in little baggies, if you remember the little page with a little strip, you know, and had your number on it, you know. You know you, we numbered everybody. <laughs> we were the Antichrist, you know. But no, people would come in and get the tapes because they wouldn't necessarily want to come into the church because they think Chuck was weird, so they wanted to get the tapes in order to find out. Or they had heard him, you know, so they wanted to get taped after service, so we always had to have him ready. So anyway, my point being is this. I used to go to Chuck Missler's study on Monday night, and so I got really into prophecy. Then I used to go to the school of the Bible, where Chuck actually blew people's minds by having a woman teacher teach men. <gasps> she was Jewish, by the way. And she taught Matthew, which was... And she taught it in a way that even Missler didn't teach which was even a way that, to this day, I don't hear anybody teach. Especially about how Matthew was broken up in the genealogy and why it's broken up into its segments. Oh, yeah. Jewish memory trick. Hey. You know, but anyways. And I later confirmed it when I went to Israel and I was, you know, doing my, my heritage kind of routine. So, my point being is this. I went to studies continually, constantly, over and over again, Soaking it, soaking it, soaking it, soaking it, soaking it, soaking it. I mean, I was like in it always. I mean, it wasn't like any time that I had free because I was spending all my time literally in the Word. Now, because of that, I got into, and in those days, we used to say Jesus was coming. And there were nights where we felt like Jesus was coming that night. I mean, so help me, Chuck could have just went, you know, and floated up into heaven and we'd have followed right after him. You know, I mean, it was kind of those kind of nights. But... In those days, it was pretty obvious that, you know, and everybody, Benny Hester would show up, you know, and then we think that we were going to be raptured that moment. And Benny Hester and the band, wow, you know, we all know he's coming, Jesus is coming. And it was like, you know, the times. But as I studied the scriptures, I had a question finally. I mean, I always ask God questions, but I always spend time alone with God. I never asked anybody. I didn't get involved with people. I wasn't close to anybody. Benny and Eileen, we would talk, but I would share things because... I began to realize slowly at Calvary that not everyone had the same experience as I did, and not everyone was like gifts of the Spirit or doing things. You know, a lot of people were, you know, pretty carnal. I mean, you know, there were some carnal people wandering around Calvary at times. You know, a lot of people with some bad attitudes, a lot of people with some, you know, strange teachings, strange theology. Romaine used to say, and it was true, you'd open up the north door and the south door, and boom, the wind would blow, and guess what? There went half the Calvary you know, or that service. You know, and they go start some weird doctrinal Calvary. You know. And in those days, anybody could start a Calvary chapel. And they did. And <laughs> they got pretty weird for a while there. I remember the first home Bible study, the first home pastor Bible study class, you know, that we recorded for Calvary. That was interesting. You know? <laughs> that was kind of interesting. You know? This was all before there were Bible colleges, and before Arrowhead, and before, you know, Marietta and all that. You know, but my point is this. 
I was shy. I was intimidated. I saw Chuck. I wanted to go up and talk to Chuck. And I was scared. I was like, you know. And I was kind of like, I had a question about Ezekiel 42.20, you know, and it said that there would be a separation between the holy place and profane. And Chuck was getting ready to talk about, you know, at the time it was very popular to be teaching, because how Lindsay came out with his book and all that stuff, to be teaching that the temple, you know, was going to be built on the, on the Dome of the Rock, and that there had to be, and you know, Chuck was very good at this, he'd, he'd say things about what, what this says, that says, the commentary says, and he says, I don't like commentary, this is what I think, or... Or he'd say, well, I don't know. You know, I'd say those things. But you know, at that point in time, people were teaching on the Dome of the Rock, and they would say, there has to be either a great earthquake to break down the Dome of the Rock, or there's going to be a, uh, an attack of some kind where the, the Temple Mount will be shaken, or there'll be, you know, during the Ezekiel, 42, Ezekiel War, there'll be, you know, like a missile destroy it. You know, but something will happen with the Dome of the Rock's got to be gone before the Temple's built. And the first time that I heard anybody teach it, I said, that's not right. And I just knew it wasn't right. I just, how I knew, I don't know. But, you know, Missler used to say, examine, prove all things, you'll know, study. And I went to so many Missler studies that, you know, I was like, I loved it. I would study what he said to study. Other people were blown out. I wasn't. I'd argue. I'd go back and talk to him about it. You know, I'd say, hey, I, you know, you know, I, he, he liked it. You know, I mean, he liked being asked questions. He liked giving out information and provoking you to study on your own. And so he taught me to examine in detail the scriptures and to prove them. And later in Jewish culture, when I went back to the tractates and to Talmudic reasoning and logic and the way that Jews study, oh yeah, good thing that I learned from Missler. <laughs> it was like, wow, yeah, I'm ready. Because it would have taken me years to figure out, you know, uh, rabbinical literature, much less rabbinical teaching. And the way that the Jewish mindset works and operates in, in the Torah, much less in the prophets and the, the writings. But my point is that I was getting ready to come up to Chuck, you know, and I, I had my Bible and I was terrified and, you know, he wasn't, I don't know if he was tall or short, but I remember it was dark, you know, and he was standing right there, you know, and he says, hi, you know, he said something, you know, kind of, hello, you know, just casual, but, you know, just quiet, real soft spoken, and just, hello, and I said, Chuck and I said, and is he good for you? I was like, I had to go right to it. I couldn't say hello. I couldn't say anything because I was shaking. <laughs> Chuck and Ezekiel 4220, I said, it says that there should be a separation between a holy place and a profane. I said, don't you think that it's possible that the Dome of the Rock doesn't have to be destroyed, but that God could put a wall, a separation between the Temple Mount, you know, the part for the Jew and the holy place for the, the Jew, and then the profane place would be like the Dome of the Rock? And he says, what was that scripture? And I'd go, Ezekiel 42.20. So he, you know, had his Bible, like, right here, you know, and he opened his Bible, and he looked down at it, and he says, I'll have to look into that. He says, I think so. And I went, I, I don't even know if I even said thank you or okay or whatever. And it was like, I left, like, well, first of all, I left full of fire inside. It was like, ah! You know, because I was like, oh! But what he did for me in that moment was that he confirmed to me that God could use me. You see, my self-esteem, oh boy. Huh. Wow, where did that come from, Lord? Left field! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> oh boy! Thanks, Chuck. I'm going to get you for that one. My self-esteem in those days did not exist. You know, oh, sure, people thought I had some kind of attitude, you know, because God was still working on me, but the persona that I had growing up as a child was that I was full of sarcasm, and I was very intelligent and had intellect, and I had common sense, you know, there's a certain amount of common sense, you know, but I was superficial, just like most Southern California people are. Matter of fact, most people that I meet from Southern California are a bunch of flakes. You know, I gotta admit, I was a flake. I know. I, it takes a flake to know one, and I know the flakes. You know, I mean, they're, they're like worthless. You know, and I had to actually go to Oregon and, and work by the sweat of my brow to prove to myself and then to grow up into getting some chutzpah and some guts to what my words would say, working for a Russian, by the way, you know, and out in the potato fields. But, um, as a, 
pot, I worked on a pot Devon assembly machine, which was a potato bagging machine that we made the bags for them, you know, and, and that's what we made. It was like 150 feet long. It's called Apprentice Pressman, so anyways. But I worked for him for a year, and he, he, he told me that he would break me and that I would quit before the year was up. I didn't. <laughs> Stubborn. Stiff type. But I became a man, you know, as I, I went from a boy and a flake and worthless and meaningless and jerk and stupid and ignorant to being a man by the time I was done working with him. From that moment on, any job that I went to, I was, I was a man. I was a man. And so, what happened before that, though, was there in Southern California, my self-esteem was so poor and so dependent upon this new gifts of the Holy Spirit, this new feeling from God, this new emotional ride that I was on, that when Chuck confirmed to me that word that I had studied on my own, I had checked all the commentaries, I had talked to Missler about, you know, and he didn't answer me, you know, he was like, I'll look into it. Um, but no one else had ever said anything about it at that time. I mean, I couldn't find anything on the commentaries, even Gill, John Gill, you know, and all, and all kinds of people. Nobody was teaching that. So I was surprised, and then later God spoke to me on it, and he says, see, I can use you. And I was like, I, I broke down and cried. I bawled like a baby that night. I mean, I must have bawled all night long. <laughs> I mean, I just, ah! You know, just crying and crying and crying and crying. Because I realized God could use me. Now, that produced another problem that took a while to God to work out in my life. Because I, then I needed to know, well, God, do you have a place for me in my in your kingdom? You know, like, in other words, God called me. And I didn't realize that it was the calling of God, you know, on my life. But it was like, God called me. There was no, no doubt. I mean, looking back now, I go, yeah, you know, <laughs> I was called 30 years ago. What happened? You know, where did I go? You know, no, we're kidding. Well, we're not kidding, but it's true. But the point is this. My self-esteem was so bad that I used to think of myself as a failure at everything and a success at nothing. And so everything that I put my hand to, I thought of as failure because obviously I had issues that were going on from not having a proper childhood, supposedly, not having a father figure, supposedly. Actually, my mother was the best father I ever had. But my point is that she was pretty tough for a mother. She had, boy, was she a mother. <laughs> no, she was a father. <laughs> She's the best father. You know, she was a lousy mother. But, boy, was she a father. <laughs> Man. And she raised us, you know. I mean, she married again, you know. And she had uh, too many stepfathers. You know, I had too many stepfathers or men around, you know. She wasn't a drunk or alcoholic or didn't, you know, whatever. But she was the other woman in a relationship at one point in time for my sisters to be married. So that kind of gives you an idea where her mindset was. So after I got saved, I witnessed to her, and eventually she got saved, and my sisters got saved. So it's like, the other way I got saved. But my point is this. Chuck confirmed to me and gave to me that confirmation, that encouragement, that anointing from him, through him, to me, that I felt the Holy Spirit go, whoa. And I mean, it was like you could almost see it come through, down, out, and to me. And I was like, wow. And then God spoke to me that night. And from that moment on, you know, I mean, I had always been a prophecy. You know, you know, by my peers, I was a prophecy student for a long time. But I'm a prophecy scholar. I mean, I argue with people now. You know, I mean, it's sad because I think that the only thing I want to tell them is how can you be so stupid? You know, because I don't understand the ignorance in scripture when it comes to prophecy. I see what they say, but I don't understand how they can be stupid enough to believe it. And that's partially their own fault, because they want to believe it in prophecy. A lot of times in Scripture, there is that tendency to want to believe more than prove to believe. Mr. always said, prove all things, hold fast, that's good. That's why there's four moons and, you know, this whole moon, moon theology that came out recently is so stupid that it's hard to believe that anybody falls for it. And yet I have so many Calvary pastors, you know, doing it. I'm going, Lord, you know, you really want me to confront this? I, you know, like that. Better to be made dumb and fall on your own theology than to fail on your own theology than to, you know, be made fools of by someone else, you know, and prove out, you know, that there's conflict within the body of Christ, which, frankly, they should be studying. I mean, it's answerable within the scriptures. Everything is very obvious in scripture. You don't need anything new. And the four moons, you know, and the red moons and all this stuff is a bunch of bull because it's not from the moons. And it's all kinds of theology that's been added to the scriptures that have nothing to do with, quite frankly, prophecy. And it just amazes me how people in these latter days 
want to be what we were in the Jesus movement, so adamant about Jesus coming that night, that they are susceptible to the 88 reasons Jesus, you know, was coming. I never saw the book because I was gone by then. You know, I was already out on, you know, mission field. I never even saw the book. I wouldn't have believed it at the time. I was already past that part. You know, I was already able to prove things wrong. You know, a lot of times I was able to prove more things wrong than I was able to prove things right. You know, until finally I started studying on the, you know, rapture and the day of the rapture. And then I started teaching on why Jesus wouldn't come before 2013, you know. And when 2000 rolled around, I was sitting in Jerusalem, you know, at the time on the mountaintop, you know, kind of looking around going, dudes, it ain't going to happen tonight because there are a lot of wacko Christians running around thinking that the end of the world is coming on 2000, you know. And I had to tell them, no, it's not going to happen. No, it's not. We're not going to have a crash. But it amazes me how Chuck had confirmed to me that word and how later what happened was that Chuck later on in his teaching had approached the subject a little more open to it and said it's possible. And then many more years later, he had apparently studied it and he says he was teaching. He says it is likely, you know, and I'm pretty sure he, one time he said it is going to happen that there'll be a, a wall separation divided. You know. So anyways, my point was that simply, you know, I don't have a problem with people having different interpretations and understandings within their learning curve and their learning as they do. But I wanted to give a shout out to Chuck because Chuck ruined me in one way because I was so adamant about prophecy that, you know, he ruined me because I wanted to argue with people later on and, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know now I do know, you know, and I'm kind of like pretty confident about, you know, the years that are left to us, very few, that even now I kind of go, uh, come on guys, you know, you guys are great in what you're doing. You've got mega ministries. Why don't you know prophecy? You know, and I'm kind of flustered about it, you know, but I know that God uses the foolish things to confound the wise, you know, so it's like, you know, if you think you got a lot of years left, dudes, you know, you got a, like 80% chance of possibility that after Billy Graham's kicked the bucket, you know, it's over, man, you know, you don't have much time after that. So, whatever you were doing, if you don't have enough of the spirit, you're not going to get much more, guess what, kind of dried up, drying up, filled up, better be planned up. And, the point is this, is that 2015 does look good, not because of moves. 2017 looks really good. 2022 looks like really, really, really good. So if you wanted to do probability factors, is what we call it in prophecy and eschatology, because when you do sit among scholars in international circles, then you talk about probability factors. You don't talk about it's going to happen on this day. We do know the feast. We do know within a 10-day period, 7 to 10 days, you know, when the rapture is basically going to occur. We do know that it's going to be during that time. We do know that it can occur during a 7-day feast, but it can occur during the 10-day. So because there's three days that are tacked onto the 7. My point is, the feast of uh, born again, you know, the feast when the moon is born again, you know, there's Jewish culture that, you know, some people don't seem to know. I don't know why they don't study it. I don't know why they don't do it. Except blindness in part has happened to Israel. Well, blindness in part happened to the evangelicals in some ways. You know, they've gone into politics rather than into prophecy. What can I say? If you go into politics, you're not going to get prophecy. If you go into prophecy, you're not going to get into politics. It's the way it works. So, I'm not into politics, but I am into prophecy. So, yeah, 2015 is pretty much what most people see now as being, most people that I call in the know, as being 80%, you know, the high percentile groups. The high percentile groups happen occurring during this time period when you add all factors involved in the Word of God, not the weather's systems, not the earthquakes, not the tidal waves, not the nuclear factors or the nation national factors. So just go circular. They consistently get to where they're consistently getting closer and closer and closer and closer until the actual fulfillment. And God can choose to use or postpone it any time that He wants to. My point is this. If you want to know, like Chuck used to say, hey, you know, you want to know, you can always find out, just ask God. You know, and that, quite frankly, that's what he used to say, you know, to me, you know, he used to say in a study that I watched, you know, was that, you know, study. He says, if you want to know, study. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. If the Holy Spirit's guiding you and, you know, it's showing you and telling you, go for it, you know, and I went, okay, so I did, you know. <laughs> that's how I got here today. That's why I'm here today. That's why I'm talking about Chuck. He said, go for it. I did. Chuck. And so, 
2014, eh, you know, that'll probably be a time when people get back into politics. Christians kind of get sidetracked. Billy Graham will pass away. People will be less evangelical in their realization of Jesus coming again. There'll be more of this off kilter idea about the rapture, about, you know, well, you know, like anybody and everybody's going to be saved, so, you know, what do we got to do anything about? We just take it easy and cruise. We'll cruise because we don't have to worry about snooze because we won't lose because we're going. I uh, no, but, you know, and there'll be a few that will be looking at and realizing that, hey, you know, this is serious. You know, they'll be sober-minded and you know, they'll be recognizing the signs of the times that they live in. And then about 2015, you know, then it'll be kind of like, wow, politics will definitely take everyone's attention, move them into that distraction where the potential of 2015, 16, 17 is great for there being those led away, like the five foolish virgins and the five wise being prepared for the Lord's return. Should it happen in 2015, would not be a big surprise. Should it happen in 2017, would not be a big surprise. 2016 would surprise me a little bit, but you know, it's possible. 2022, I always have told people since, I don't know, about the year 2000, that if the Lord carries till then, I would be shocked and I want an apology. That's how adamant I am about some things when it comes to eschatology. Now, what's funny is that, you know, in the old days, in the Jesus movement, before the 80s, eight whatever heresy thing that went on or whatever that thing was, where people got caught up into it, I remember... At Calvary, you know, Jesus is coming was on the side of the building. And we used to talk about it all the time. Chuck used to talk about Jesus coming all the time. I've noticed Calvary's don't talk about it a lot. A lot of Calvary's, you know, if the Lord tarries, if the Lord tarry, oh, Terry Lord, oh, Terry, Terry, you know, pardon me, but, you know, give me a Terry cloth towel because I want to weep. Because you know what? That wasn't what we were about. We were talking about Jesus is coming, man, now. Now, even more so than what we ever thought before. But he's coming in our generation. You can't hear Calvary pastors say that too much. Very few, one or two, might risk it once in a while, but they avoid the subject like the plague. They do not want to risk, and I will, saying, Jesus is coming in our generation. We are the last generation, dudes. You know, this is it. Only because of this. And it's sad to say, but it's true. The kids grew up. Hey, we had kids. They grew up. I don't want to see my kids, you know. And Jesus understands that. Jesus knows. Jesus, when he was born, Rachel weeping for her children, for they are no more. They were slaughtering of the innocents. I got news for you. The book of Acts wasn't like a cake ride like the Jesus movement. We're going to get tribulation. We're going to get persecution. We're going to get some trials to prove your heart. And I hate to say it, but with all this kind of like hatred towards President Obama and kind of like all these other different people that we should be witnessing to, it's high time to get out of politics, get away from violence, get away from all those things that distract us and put our focus back in on Jesus and what he said to do in these times that we live in and to share the gospel and to witness to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, to witness to the entire nation, making disciples of all nations. Which now I'm glad with the Bible schools we're doing. I hope we're teaching sound doctrine, like evangelism. I hope we're teaching that they can know Jesus in a personal, intimate way, like intimate relationship. I hope we are not just giving, you know, the expositional capabilities of systematic theology, because quite frankly, systematic theology is a Greek, Greek idea. It's Greco. It doesn't mean it's Hellenism. It doesn't mean that it's wrong, but it doesn't mean that it's right. The Catholics had their own way, and they kind of missed it along the way, right? The Protestants had their own way, and they kind of missed it along the way. The Jews had it their way, and they missed it along the way. Are you missing a part here? You might want to kind of sit down and have a talk with God. Because even though I love Chuck, and Chuck inspired me, and this is my Chuck story, hey, even Chuck would say, I don't know on some things. Chuck would say, you need to really examine the scriptures and prove these things. He would say that we need to talk about and spend time with the Spirit of God as he revealed Jesus to us. We need to be led by the Spirit so that we would be the sons of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. We need to have that love and that joy, looking forward to Jesus. 
the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh yes, we need to teach grace, but we need to put it in its place, that it is for salvation. But we don't get away with grace after we've been saved and just say, oh, grace, grace, man, we're going on to heaven. We're going to be raptured. There are people going to die based upon your theology. There are people that are going to go into persecution based upon your eschatology. There are people that are going to suffer because they weren't told the full gospel that guess what? Jesus will be with you, but you will die. Literally. It is more than likely that most of us will die from physical death so that we can inherit eternal life. Oh yeah, we are guaranteed salvation, but the cost of discipleship is the life of the flesh. It must be crucified and it must die. Except that it die a seed of except that a seed fall to the ground and perish, it shall not bring forth life. I dare say that we need to be careful to examine ourselves to prove whether we be in the faith and what we are saying and doing and living and being. Chuck finished the course. Thank God. I remember there was a time when I was listening to him teach and I thought, he should go to Arizona. And then he caught on it. I went, whoa. Wonder what that's all about. And I'd love to go to Arizona to find out. You know, I don't know. But there was a time back when we gave some teaching and he said, I've been thinking about, you know, packing it up and taking it to Arizona. And I went, wow. And I was, you know, I don't remember. It was before 2000, I think. But I remember that there was a big shockwave that went through Big Calvary at the time. Um, those of us that were there, and I was kind of like, whoa, I don't know, what's that all about? Kind of, hmm. Interesting. And I, oh, maybe I was over in Jerusalem, I think. I might have been in Jerusalem at the time when I heard the tape. It must have been a tape I heard. But it was interesting that, you know, he mentioned that because, you know, then, don't know whatever happened of it, but, you know, he didn't. And then, you know, you heard of all these different people that were wanting to take over Calvary and all that kind of stuff. And I've heard a lot of Calvary pastors talk about that at some point in time. Some of them, too. <laughs> what can I say? I was a good ear and I prayed. But um, Chuck blessed me. Literally. And that was what it was. By just simply sharing the Word of God. And his attitude towards it, his action with it, his knowledge of it, and the testimony that he was for it. Because of that, I became a man of the Word. And I'm not, my hermeneutic homiletic is assured, and I'm not in any problem with arguing anyone in theology. Oh, yeah, when I say argue, I mean from a Jewish way. You know, Jewish way is not argument, doesn't mean negative. It's positive. It's very positive. But, you know, I can sit down with the best of them, you know, and have no problem discussing anything. You know, and any dogma, doctrine, or, you know, um, explanation man gives of the Word of God. When it comes to the Word of God, oh boy, baby, we haven't even scratched the surface, and I'm living it and loving it and enjoying it because of Chuck. Because of Chuck Missler, because of Chuck Smith, because of that time when he said to me that very perspective that I have to look into, it, you know, but it's very possible. And I just went, wow, this man who had no self-esteem suddenly was esteemed of God to have been faithful to ask a man of God what he thought. And that man of God blessed him with exactly the gift from God that I needed, which was the realization that Jesus could use someone like me. Because the fact is, Jesus wants to use someone like me.